All right, well, you guys ready to jump in the word this morning? Okay, all right, all right. Some of you aren't sure. Some of you are, are quiet and unsure, but some of you are ready. Okay, good, I like it. Um, all right, well, I want to start this morning by, by talking about this guy in the Bible. You may or may not have heard of him. His name is Jephthah. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Go with me, because that's the best I can do, okay? Um, his name is Jephthah. You can read about him more in Judges chapter 11, um, if you want to study his life this week. Um, but we learn about this guy named Jephthah, and the first thing we hear about him is he's a brave and a mighty warrior. So Jephthah already has fame about himself that he's a brave and a mighty warrior, but Jephthah is also a man of great pain. And he came into the world with um, a lot of rejection. So his father was named Gilead, a man of the community in Israel, and his mother was a prostitute. And so we can assume that he experienced a lot of othering, a lot of rejection, a lot of you're not one of us, you don't belong. Um, we know that to be true because Gilead's actual wife has children, and those children hate Jephthah. And her sons actually um, really mistreat him and drive him away. And um, we hear this story that um, they basically rally together, get the community together, they drive him away, and they tell him, you're going to have no part in your father's inheritance. And uh, we can assume from the story that Jephthah tried to advocate for himself, that he went to the elders and the community leaders asking for help, and they didn't help. In fact, they contributed to him being rejected and driven away. And this happens in the book of Judges. This is a time in history that is super volatile. It is violent. It is crazy. There is so much wickedness, so much going on. And so for Jephthah to be driven away out of the community, this was like a death sentence because you needed the community to survive. This, was, this is beyond the wild, wild west. This is crazy times. And you needed the tribe to survive. And so for Jephthah, this is like, this is like a death sentence. And he gets driven out. There's so much rejection driven from his family, driven from his community. He's left to survive. And um, it's kind of where we begin with this story of Jephthah. And um, Jephthah begins to settle. You know, he, he goes off and he settles in a place called Tob. And depending on the translation you use, um, the Bible's funny, but it, some of the translation says where he found a gang of scoundrels or a group of worthless rebels... <laughs> Uh, there was lots of, different, lots of different ways that they're explained. Um, but this group of kind of, you know, wild, crazy ones rally around him, and he kind of becomes their leader, and they begin to raid other communities. They're like kind of the Robin Hoods of the day. They're out, they, and they have this name for themselves. Like, people know them as these kind of fearless warriors, and Jephthah is the leader of them. And you know, this is interesting because, um, you know, I think Jephthah had a wound of rejection. And you know what often happens when you have a wound of rejection is you tend to attract and draw other people who have a wound of rejection. Have you noticed? Um, and so that's what's happening here. And, um, you know, often the rejected attract the rejected. So as time goes on, um, a group called the Ammonites, they start fighting against Israel, which is, you know, Jephthah's homeland. And the leaders of Gilead, they come looking for Jephthah, and they find him in Tob, and they begin to plead with him, Jephthah, come back, fight for us, we need you, we're going to get defeated by the Ammonites. And you can imagine how this conversation goes, right? Jephthah's like, now you want me, right? Where were you when I was being driven out? Like, you drove me out, but now you want me. Now you want me to come back, you know? And, and he's, he's not having it. And so they're like, Jephthah, we swear, if you come back, we're going to make you commander of the army, and we're going to make you leader over all the people of Gilead. And he's like, swear, you know? And they're like, all right, fine, you know? So he's like, okay, whatever. So he goes back with him. And... Um, he goes back, and um, it's interesting because, um, you know, we see very quickly that Jephthah is actually very wise. He, he doesn't rush into war. He actually 
does everything in his power to stop war from happening. He's, he's diplomatically trying to de-escalate. He's trying to talk to the, the, the king of the Ammonites, you know, trying to reason, trying, can we come to a settlement? Can we come to an agreement? He's not wanting his people to have to go into war. But um, the king of the Ammonites was not interested in peace. And it, we learn in Judges eleven twenty nine. 29, it says, then the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. I love this. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. And he begins to lead the people against the Ammonites. And, you know, this is a powerful moment in Jephthah's life. We see God take this man who's been rejected so many times. We see God take this man with this deep wound of rejection. And God says, I choose you. Because isn't it like God to choose what the world rejects? I love this about God. He could have picked anybody to lead, and he's like, you know who's going to be the perfect one? Jephthah, out in Tob, running, a, running, you know, wrecking havoc on people. That's who I want. That's who I'm going to put my spirit on. The ones the world has rejected, I've got purpose. I've got destiny for you. Right? And so the spirit of the Lord comes on Jephthah. This means there's favor. This means God is with him, right? There is purpose. There is destiny. We begin to watch God roll out a story of redemption for his life. God's like, I have chosen you to do powerful things. I have chosen you to shift the course of history. I am with you, Jephthah. I, I choose you. Man has rejected you, but I choose you. This is exactly who our God is. And so God is inviting Jephthah into a story of redemption over the lie of rejection in his life. The Spirit of the Lord comes on Jephthah. God chooses him to, to lead the people to victory. You know, it's interesting, too. I didn't realize this until I was studying. Is Jephthah, you will see mentioned later in Hebrews 11, is one of the greats of the faith. He's listed there. This kid who was rejected, he's listed there with Moses and David and the prophets. He's listed there as one of the greats of faith. I love this. Now, I can't prove this because the Bible is not like, and then this is what was going on inside of Jephthah's soul at this moment. Like, we don't know a lot of the subtext. So this is my interpretation of what I see happening here. Um, but I think that the lie of God was moving in Jephthah's life. God was with him. The spirit was on him. But I think the lie of rejection had not yet been really rooted out of his life. His circumstances had shifted. Things were looking up. Yet if you don't address the root of rejection in your life, it's going to rear its head. And that's exactly what I believe happened to Jephthah. Um, God was already with him. Scholars do not understand why this happened. Nobody knows why he did this. God was not requiring anything of him. This was so left field. God is with him. You know, everything's good. And he just, all of a sudden, Jephthah blurts out unnecessarily. And he makes this crazy vow to God. God, if you let us win, the first thing that walks out my front door when I give home, I'll offer as a sacrifice to you. Like, why, Jephthah? Why? What are you doing? Right? Like, this was not a requirement of the Lord. What are you doing? And I'll tell you my interpretation of this. To me, I think this feels like that root of rejection. Because how rejection works oftentimes makes you feel like, wait, am I really accepted by God? God's like, I'm with you. And you're like, am I really cool with you, God? Or do I need to do more to prove to you? And he's like, what else can I do? What else can I give? Like, God, are you really with me? It's almost like this desperate plea of like, but wait, am I really good with you? And it's, it feels like that to me. Um, no, nobody knows why he did this. Um, and so as the story goes on, um, Jephthah leads the people of God into victory. They have a, a huge, a huge, a huge victory. And um, of course, as he comes home, he walks, you know, and I don't know, you know, some scholars are like, well, maybe he thought an animal was going to come out that he was going to offer as a sacrifice. You know, who knows what he's thinking? But as he gets home, um, his one and only child, his daughter, whom he loved, comes running out to greet his, her dad and just celebrate him and his victory. And Jephthah loses it. And he's like, no. 
tears his clothes, and he just begins to wail and moan and grieve, and he's like, what have I done? I've made a vow. I have to keep it. I have to offer you as a sacrifice. And, you know, of course, she's like, wait, what? <laughs> How'd I get in this? <laughs> um, and it's this painful moment. And, of course, the Bible doesn't give us all the, like, context like we want it, at least how I want it. Basically, it's like, and he made good on his vow. You're like, whoa, 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 what happened? Like, what happened? Um, there's some debate. Um, some scholars think he actually killed his daughter as a sacrifice. Some think, um, he, no, he didn't kill her. Um, he presented her to the temple to be of service. I actually fall there for a few reasons. Um, one is um, when Jephthah, well, first of all, there's several places in scripture that show us that Jephthah was a man of scripture. He knew scripture. He knew theology. He quotes it in several places. So he would have known, if he was a man of scripture, he would have known that it was absolutely against the will and nature of God to offer human sacrifices. God, Old Testament scripture was very clear. The people of Israel were very clear that this was not acceptable to God. So it makes no sense why you would do something detestable to God to try to honor God. Um, the other part is because in this passage, when he tells his daughter, I have to offer you as a sacrifice, she's like, okay, but you know, can you give me two months to go cry with my friends that I'll never get to marry and have children, that I'll be a virgin forever? And that's what she goes to cry about. She doesn't go to cry that she's going to die. She goes to cry that she's never going to have a family. And then the end of that passage says, and she was never with a man. So it is my assumption, who knows, that she was kind of presented to the temple, um, kind of like Samuel was, right? Presented to the temple as in the service of the Lord, like a perpetual virgin, like a nun, basically presented to the temple. Who really knows? The whole story is tragic, though. <laughs> the whole story, there's like this beautiful piece of it where there's this beautiful faith that makes history, where it's a story of redemption in this man's life. But also, what I believe happens so often is if we don't deal with the roots of rejection in our own lives, they resurface and they get passed on to the next generation. And what we see happen here is Jephthah, who had other people make decisions about his life, he lost control of his own life because other people made poor decisions and he was, he was pulled out of family against his own will. And that deepest place of pain, he ends up, because I believe he doesn't deal with that root of rejection in his life, he ends up doing the very same thing to his daughter, taking the control away from her own life. She has to miss out on family, right? And so, um, you know, I think this, the story of Jephthah is both beautiful and tragic. Um, but in this story, in this story, I, I think we learn and we see there is a lie of rejection. That's what I want to talk about this morning is the lie of rejection. There is a lie of rejection that the enemy tries to sow in us. And if we are not intentional about really, really dealing with it, it will keep popping up in other areas of your life. Okay? You guys with me? Um... So before we get into the lie, I want to talk about the truth. The truth is, God is love. I hope we all know that. God is love. He deeply loves humanity. God is motivated entirely by love. It's who he is. It's how his kingdom operates. Everything he does is through love. Listen, the verses I chose this morning, I, we're going to read them all, almost all of them out of the Amplified, so just deal with all the words. Okay. Um, I was really vibing with Amplified this week, but it's a lot of words, so just hang in there. Um, John 3, 16. Old, old faithful here. Ready? For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten son. So whoever believes and trusts in him as savior shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so greatly loved the world. He loved us. That's why he comes to us. His position towards us is love. God's position towards humanity is pure love. Right? It's also true that God loved us before he redeemed us. In our mess and sin, his love was, listen, his love has never ever been based off of your behavior. God's love towards you is not based off of your behavior. 
Romans 5, 8, but God clearly shows and proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So often the lie of the enemy is God only loves you when you're doing good. Or that God somehow is going to withhold love from you when you're making bad choices. That is not the truth of the gospel. God loved you while you were in your most shameful, ugly, disgusting, embarrassing moment. God chose you. God loves you. God came for you. God redeemed you. God says, you're worth it to me. The love of God is not based on our behavior. It's also true that God chooses us and wants us and adopts us as his own. Ephesians 1 says, 4 and 5, just as in his love... He chose us in Christ, actually selected us for himself as his own before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy, that is consecrated, set apart for him, purpose-driven, and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined and lovingly planned for us to be adopted to himself as his own children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the kind intention and good pleasure of his will. I love this. God chooses you. He adopts you, not like some, you know, you're kind of adopted, you can live in the basement and work for me. No. Adopted into his family, full rights, full privileges. Right, once again, not based off of your behavior. Not like, oh, you know what? You're adopted onto the first floor because you're so good. And you're like lucky you made it in. You can live in the basement. Like that's, that's not, doesn't exist in the kingdom of God. We are chosen, we are adopted, all of us, as sons and daughters. That gives him pleasure. That was always the plan of God, to make you his family. It's also true that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God likes you. And all your weird little funky quirkiness, he he likes you. He delights in you. He doesn't need you to change to be somebody else to be more likable to be more lovable. He likes you the way you are. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, his own master work, a work of art. You are God's work of art, his masterpiece. He enjoys you. He doesn't want you trying to be somebody else. When you are the masterpiece the way you are, You see, when we really understand these truths, we're going to get set free from the lies that tell us, I need to adjust to be more A, B, C, for God to accept me, for people to love me. No, when we get really freed and, man, I am am a masterpiece. When somebody rejects you, you don't, it doesn't affect your value because you know who you are, right? When you really understand that you are chosen and loved by God and somebody rejects you, it doesn't affect It doesn't, it doesn't shake you. It's okay. I might not, I say this all the time. I'm I'm not everybody's cup of tea. That is for sure. I am not. I know that to be true. Many people have made that clear to me. That's fine. I don't have to be everybody's cup of tea. But you know what? God loves me. And I am secure in him. And just because you don't like receive me or love me or accept me doesn't speak anything about my value. Because I belong to him. He paid a big price for me. And he says, I'm a masterpiece. I'm a little weird. I get it, but I'm his masterpiece, right? And it's not an excuse to, like, not be transformed. Let's go. We all need to be, like, letting God transform us. We're all evolving and growing, all that, yes. But it's being rooted in these truths. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. It's also true that God's love heals our fear, our rejection. In fact, God's love is the remedy to our fear of rejection, First uh, John 4, 18 and 19. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear. Because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment. So the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love. Has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. We love because he first loved us. We're not to live with this constant fear of God's punishment. It's easy to think, is God going to withhold his love for me? Is God going to withhold opportunity for me because I'm not perfect? 
None of us are. This is not his nature. His love drives away our fear. You know, when we encounter his love, the fear of rejection is cast out. We get free, free to be who God's called us to be, free to do what he's called us to do. You know, so not only are we unconditionally loved and chosen, redeemed, made holy through what Jesus did, we belong, but we're also powerful co-heirs with Christ. We're ambassadors, we carry the kingdom, we're full of authority. We're members of God's family. This is the truth of the gospel. It's the good news that Jesus gave his life for. Jesus came to demonstrate to you and I, to to bring the message, you are forever forgiven. You are accepted. You belong to me. You belong in my family. It's good. The debt against you is paid. I have cleared your sin, your past sin, your present sin, your future sin. I am big enough. I love you. I accept you. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what the devil says. It doesn't matter what the rap sheet of your life says. I love you. I choose you. I redeem you. You're mine. And just like the story of Jephthah, God is constantly looking to rewrite the stories of rejection in our life with the truth. So that's the truth. But what's the lie? You know, in contrast, where God is all about love, and belonging, and restoration, the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. The enemy hates love. The enemy is entirely void of love. The enemy hates that you're a co-heir with Christ. He hates that you're loved, that you're chosen, that you belong. He hates that Christ in you makes you more powerful than him. Did you hear me? Christ in you makes you more powerful than him. He hates that you actually have more authority than him. The only authority he has is when you, he can get you to agree with a lie and you hand over your authority to him. He has no authority of his own. And so he's, he operates, he traffics in lies, trying to convince us of things that aren't true so that we go, oh, well, maybe, maybe I'm not really you know, totally, like, accepted by God, like that perfect little Christian over there. And all of a sudden, when you come into agreement with a lie, it opens up a door, it creates a hook, it creates an opportunity for the enemy to begin to wreak havoc in your life. Satan comes in and he says, well, God actually rejects you because you're divorced, gay, a hypocrite. I mean, fill in the blank. He's endless. He's endless in his lies. So he comes bringing a lie that somehow the cross was good enough for everybody but you. Or somehow your situation is just too complicated and too messy for you to really be on the end with God. Like somehow there's classes in the kingdom. The real in ones and then the like you're lucky you might get saved ones. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't exist. The truth is all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all equal in our need for a Savior, every single one of us. There are no sins that are of, of you know, a higher value. There are, it, all of us, whether you live like the perfect little model life or you had a really messy life, we have all sinned, and we are all in the same position in need of a Savior. We are all equal in our need for a Savior, and the cross makes us all equal makes us all equal. The cross is enough for somebody's self-righteousness or somebody's, you know, murder. For somebody's pride or somebody's greed. Whatever it is, the cross makes an even playing field for everybody. The blood of Jesus is enough for everybody. The blood of Jesus makes us all pure and holy. We, We sang this morning about the holiness of God. It's not, we are holy because he is holy. He takes all of our mess, and we get his holiness. It forever blows my mind. So when when God looks at you, he doesn't see your history, your weakness, your problems. He sees Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus over you. That is the truth. You 
You know, by faith, we embrace the truth that we're loved, that we're accepted, that we're wanted, that we belong. And when you embrace that truth, you begin to feel safe enough to let the Holy Spirit transform you. Belonging comes first. Being loved and accepted comes first. And then, and then you can transform. The lie of the enemy is that you have to transform to be accepted. That you have to be more, that you have to be better, that you have to be different to be accepted. God and his kingdom operate in love and belonging, and the devil and his kingdom operate in lies and rejection. You know, the lie of rejection is one of the enemy's core assignments, core tactics that he uses to steal, kill, and destroy humanity. Because if the enemy can convince you that God doesn't really accept you, or that your acceptance is based off of your behavior, right, or that God's mercy towards you is conditional, or that you're broken, or that you don't fit in, if he can convince you of one of these lies, then his work is done. Because you will inevitably begin to self-destruct. If love and belonging set us free, then, then rejection and, you know, becomes a prison of pain and destruction in our life. You know, some people might call it a wound of rejection or a spirit of rejection. I'm going to call it the lie of rejection because the truth is all rejection is a lie if you really know who you are. If you really know who you are and you really know what God says about you and what God's done for you, all rejection is actually a lie. You know, the lie of rejection operates in a lot of ways like a cancer. It typically starts small, maybe a single incident, one wound, one incident, whether it's um, a painful breakup, whether it's um, something from, you know, your childhood or at birth, and, and, you know, maybe you're put up for adoption and there's like a, a wound of rejection that you feel like you're dealing with. Typically, rejection starts in one place, and kind of like cancer, how cancer tends to spread, if not dealt with, right, and healed, it, it, it will spread to other organs and begin to affect, you know, how several different organs function. Rejection is the same way. If rejection is not dealt with, the wound of rejection, the lie of rejection is not dealt with right away, it will begin to spread. You will find it, you'll find a fear of rejection popping up in different places in your life. You will find that it begins to, to operate in other relationships. You will find all of a sudden it's like, hey, why do I feel like I'm always being rejected now? And it begins to spread. You know, suddenly once what was a single incident becomes like a pattern in your life. It begins to drive your choices. It causes you to engage in unhealthy behaviors. And you know, rejection becomes in a lot of ways like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because when you're dealing with the lies of rejection, you begin to act in ways that actually make people not want to be around you. Has anybody noticed? And so what people do, they're like, I need a little space from you. And then what do you feel? Rejected. And it becomes this cycle. And the more rejected you feel, the more you begin to act in ways that are insecure or whatever, needy or judgmental or bitter, or you begin to self-alter. You're trying to be somebody different in every environment to make people like you. You begin to do things that make people go, I don't know if I want to be that close to you. And then you feel rejected. So it's this cycle. You know, rejection takes hold like a root in our lives. And if it's not dealt with, these fruits will begin to grow. Um, and, you know, this is a bit of a hard pill to swallow, but it's the truth. Rejection typically does not go away on its own. So often I watch people say, well, if I just had, like, a better partner who really loved me, I wouldn't be insecure. Well, if I just had better friends... I wouldn't be insecure. I wouldn't, like, be dealing with this rejection. Well, if I just got that job and got that opportunity, I wouldn't be insecure anymore. I wouldn't have this rejection. If I just had a different church, if I just had different friends, whatever, we, 
And here's the reality. People will spend their life constantly looking for the other. And here's the truth. You can get all the externals right. You can have a spouse that, that is so loving. You can have the right spiritual community around you. You can have all the right factors, and you can still feel rejected because it's an inside job. You've got to heal from the inside that root of rejection. Look at Jephthah's life. Everything was lining up. He was the leader. Everything was lining up. He was brought back into the community. Everybody's like, Jephthah, Jephthah. Like, and yet, there was still that insecure drive in him of, am I still okay with God? Do I need to do more? Do I need to perform? Am I, am I enough? So rejection doesn't go away on its own. You have to do the work of uprooting it and casting it out of your life and replacing it with truth. You know, the lie of rejection is that what Jesus, what Jesus did isn't enough for you. And the reality is rejection was stripped of its power at the cross. Um, I don't, I don't want to go into too much of this with time, but there is a high cost for believing the lie of rejection. First of all, um, there's so many studies that have been done that have shown the effects on mental health, physical health, um, relational health for people who deal with rejection. There is so rejection, there's something called rejection sensitivity, which I think is pretty similar to the fear of rejection. It's you're just sensitive to, to being rejected. And we're seeing it, it's actually like a leading factor for people who have a fear of rejection is one of the primary causes of loneliness and depression. It, there's a laundry list um, of things. Um, rejection piggybacks on the physical pain pathways in the brain. This is so fascinating. Rejection is experienced just like physical pain. The same part of your brain. In fact, studies of the brain have shown it is so similar to pain in your body that when you feel rejected, if you take a Tylenol, you'll feel better. I know, right? Like, pack some Tylenol, okay? Like, next time you're out with some friends, just pack, just pack some Tylenol. You never know. You're like, <laughs> okay, take a Tylenol real quick. Um, that is fascinating to me. So the brain takes it as pain, physical pain. Um, rejection sensitivity is a risk factor for developing depression. Um, anxiety, body dysmorphic disorder, borderline personality disorder, loneliness. Um, extreme sens sensitivity to rejection is also part of the defining criteria for avoidant personality disorder, social phobia, suicidal ideation. Um, and rejection sen sensitivity is highly common in many people with ADHD. It's very fascinating. Believing the lie of rejection is costly in your physical health, your mental health, your relationships, obviously on your spiritual health. But how did Jesus respond to rejection? Great question. Let me answer it for you. Um, how did Jesus respond to rejection? Because how do I respond? How am I supposed to respond? Because my human nature is like, I don't know, like get really sad and depressed about it, get mad, like want to cut somebody out. I don't know. Like how do we respond? Typically not like, let me respond in such a holy way to this moment where I feel so incredibly rejected and hurt by you, right? How did Jesus do it? Because I want to become like Jesus. I, I want to do this. To I don't want all this mess. I don't want all these problems in my life because I'm not doing it the right way. We know that Jesus was rejected. Isaiah 53, 3, this is the prophecy about his life, which we see fulfilled. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of deep sorrows, who was no stranger to suffering and grief. We hid our faces from him in disgust and considered him a nobody, not worthy of respect. Jesus came to his own, but we didn't receive him. We rejected him. How did he handle it? Well, here's a couple of examples. After he goes to his hometown in Nazareth, and they turn him away. In Mark 6, 6, Jesus goes out among the other villages teaching. He just, instead of, you know, throwing a fit, he just keeps on going. In Luke 9, 56, after the Samaritans refused to host Jesus and his disciples, Jesus rebukes the disciples who want vengeance, and they go on, just go on to another village. 
They get rejected, and the disciples are like, smite these idiots, you know? Like, Jesus is like, that's not how we roll, guys. That's not how we roll. We're just going to keep on going. It's cool. Let's just keep on going. Right? Um, Matthew 26, 50, or sorry, um, Matthew 26, 46, when Peter, James, and John fall asleep in the garden, Jesus' friends, who'd asked, he, he's in his moment of suffering, will you remain with me? And, and they, you know, they can't do it. And what does Jesus do? He's just like, come on, let us keep going. Or when Judas betrays him, Jesus responds by saying, friend, do what you came to do. You know, in each of these instances, Jesus' response is just to keep on, to continue on in his God-given mission. He doesn't let rejection stop him. You don't see Jesus pack up and say, well, I guess God's not really called me because people are rejecting me. I guess somebody else should be the savior of the world. You don't see him responding in anger. You don't see him throwing a pity party. You don't see him, you know, um, sulking. You don't see him giving up. He just keeps on the assignment God has called him to do. Why? Because he wasn't, Jesus wasn't focused on man's approval. He was there to honor God. And for many of us, we get so caught up because we care more about what man thinks than what God thinks. Is that fair? I think that can be true. We care more about what man thinks. We care more about our reputation versus what, you know, God's reputation. Jesus knew who he belonged to. Jesus was rooted in the Father's love. He doesn't question who he is, his value, his love, because people reject him. You see, we get to learn to respond like Jesus. My prayer is that we would be so rooted in who we are in God that we are not shaken by what's happening around us. And that we don't bite the bait of the enemy who's always right there ready ready to sow some seeds of rejection in your life, that you wouldn't bite it. You know, imagine Jesus in that moment where he's literally the, the ultimate moment of rejection. He's come to save the world. He is perfect. He is sinless. He is pure love. And what do we do? We brutally murder him. That is the ultimate picture of rejection. And in that moment, as he's suffering, what does he say? Father, forgive them. His response was forgiveness. Where rejection comes from the kingdom of darkness that is void of love, the, the remedy, the solution is to throw love at it. Forgive them. Forgive them. A big part of how we're going to be set free from the lies of rejection is we're going to have to forgive people who've hurt us. We're going to have to forgive those who've rejected us. Forgiveness is a manifestation of love. Ephesians 4, 27 and 32. Do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into sin by holding a grudge or nurturing anger, or harboring resentment, or cultivating bitterness. Instead, be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. What do we learn from watching how Jesus navigated rejection? Don't let it stop you. Stay the course. Forgive and trust that God is still at work in your life. I've seen this so many times. Many times, and you know this, you've probably heard the like, hey, if one door closes, you know, no, 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 whatever. That is actually true. Many times rejection is actually a gift to you. Many times rejection is the protection of God in your life. You have to remember, if God is saying no, it's because he's protecting you for something better. Now, I don't want to minimize because rejection can still be very painful. And not every rejection is just God saving you from something. Some things are just very painful, should never have happened, and are awful. But even in that, even in that, he's there. Even in that, it doesn't define you. Even in that, he'll redeem it and restore it. 
I mean, the truth is, which is crazy, the reason that we're accepted by the Father is because Jesus took all of humanity's rejection on himself. Right? He took all of our separated, don't fit in, not worthy, rejected on himself, and he annihilated rejection forever at the cross. Jesus suffered the greatest rejection so that you and I could be free from it, and we need a revelation of that. You know, Jesus' final word as he hung on the cross was to telestai. In Hebrew, it means it is finished. It is finished. Actually, when you look at the, the, that word and, and how it's said and the tense it's used, a better translation, probably a more proper translation is it is finished, it stands finished, and it will forever be finished. Because that word speaks to eternal. It's now it is finished and for all of time it will always be finished. The cross finished the every accusation against your life. The cross finished you not belonging, you not fitting in. The cross finished that. The determination at the cross is you belong, you are loved, you're a part of my family, I accept you, it is enough. My, my, you are clean, you are made holy, you are made new, you are loved, you belong forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. The blood of Jesus was not just for your past sins. It's for your future ones. It is finished, is, is sung over your future, not just your past. So often we can believe it for our past, but the second we mess up, somehow we're back in the lie of rejection. Nobody else? The blood of Jesus is enough forever. Forever. The theme over your life forever now is you belong, you accept, you're accepted, you have purpose, you're loved, you're mine. So how do we get free from the lie of rejection? Three things I want to say just quickly. The first one is you have to cast out the lie, which means you actually have to recognize the lie because many of us, we're so used to that narrative that we don't even recognize it as a lie. Or because it feels true, it's hard to call it a lie. Well, it feels like I'm rejected. The first step to getting free from the lie of rejection is you have to recognize it. That is a lie. When that pops up, well, God doesn't really love you, or you don't really belong, or that is a lie. Calling it out, bringing it into the light. Instead of just agreeing with it, calling it out, that is a lie. I don't care how I feel, the word says that that is a lie. I'm not, I break up with that lie. I'm tired of agreeing with that lie. I break agreements with that lie. Cast it out. Stop thinking about it. Stop, you know, focusing on it. Call it out for what it is. That is a lie and I'm not going to believe that anymore. Reject it, right? Stop agreeing with it. So that's the first step. Cast out the lie. The second step is fill the house with truth. You might remember the story in Mark 12, 43, where Jesus is telling a little story. And he says, you know, when an evil spirit comes out of a man, it travels through dry places looking for a place to rest, but it finds no place to rest. So the spirit says, hey, I'm going to go back to the home I left. And when the spirit comes back to the man, the spirit finds the home still empty. The home is swept and clean and made neat. Then the evil spirit goes out and brings seven other spirits, even more evil than it is. And all the spirits go into the man and live there. And that man has even more trouble than he had before. Anybody else read these stories in the Bible? You're like, <laughs> help me, Jesus, right? But this is a powerful story. What we're learning in this is, hey, it's not enough just to cast out the lie, cast out the demon, cast out the problem. The house was left empty. You got to fill the house. You can't just cast out the lie. You then have to fill your mind, fill your heart with the truth. you got to speak the truth over yourself. That is what protects you from the lies coming back even worse. Right? you gotta, you got to fill the house with the truth. So declaring over yourself, I am loved by God. There is nothing I could do to make God love me more or love me less. I belong I know, I might be a little odd, but I belong. I belong to God and I belong to his church. I belong to his family. There is a seat for me at his table. I, I am valuable. 
I am precious in his sight. Yes, I have flaws. I am a human, but guess what? I am holy in his eyes. I am made righteous. I, I am accepted. I don't have to hustle and prove and perform for God or anybody else. I, am, I belong just the way that I am. I belong. I'm loved. I'm accepted. Speaking truth, right? So casting out the lie, but then filling the house with the truth is equally as important. And then the last thing, the third thing for being free from the lie of of rejection is to embrace community. You know, Jesus not only reconnected you to God, but he gave you a family on this earth, his family. Ephesians 2.19, now you are citizens together with God's holy people. You belong to God's family. Can we just say, I belong to God's family? Say it out loud. Say it again. I want you to hear it in your soul. Say it again. Yeah. I don't know about you, but there have been many times the enemy tried to tell me a different story. This is the truth. You belong to God and his family because he said so. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. He said so. The church is God's family. A place of belonging, right? It's, it's a place of, of community. You weren't adopted by a single dad. You were adopted into a big family. Church isn't an event. It's not a building. It's not somewhere we go. It's something we belong to. It's a community. It's a family. We are brought into the family of God. Now, I know many of us might feel all kinds of ways about church. But God has strong feelings about the church because the church is his dream. And we are on a mission together here at Expression to go after what's in the dream of God for church. What's in God's heart? Now listen, you're going to find people in church, and people are going to people. No matter where you go, no matter what church you go to, people are going to people. Brace yourself. But they're going to people outside the church anyways. You're going to, they're going to people anywhere they go. But at least you find a community that is on the journey together of learning to love each other. We need each other. Part of how we heal from these lies of rejection is to see God in each other and call it out in each other. To see what God has put in each other. To fight for each other. To learn to do healthy confrontation together. This is, this is a part of how we overcome the pain of rejection. We learn a better way. We need each other to heal. We experience God's love and acceptance through each other. You know, one of the biggest fears when you have been wounded by the lie of rejection is to let people in again. And I want to encourage you, there's really no way to heal without learning to let people in again. Because there's certain levels of healing and freedom that can only come from within community. When people see you and celebrate you and value you and hear you and you can hear them and see them and value them and celebrate them, there's a level of healing that takes place in all of us. I want to invite the worship team. Do we have the team? Okay, great. Look at y'all. Look at y'all. Been here all day. Um, Up here with me. You know, it's interesting because, I'll be honest, really wanted to go a different direction this week. And all week long, God kept bringing this up to me. And I felt like the Lord was saying, I, it's time to deliver my church from the lie of rejection. And I feel like there are so many of us that have been so beat down by the lie of rejection. And maybe like Jephthah, it's like we're seeing these levels of breakthrough in our life, but this thing still rears its head. And God wants to uproot it out of our lives. It ends today. Prophetically, I'm declaring this. It ends today, church. The lie of rejection ends today. And I know maybe not everybody deals with this. And and praise God if if you don't struggle with this. But I want to say, so many people around you do. There are so many people outside of these doors that have believed a lie of rejection that God would never accept them that they're too broken that they're not they would never fit in the church that they would never fit in with God's family that they would 
you know, whatever. There's so much pain from the lie of rejection in people all around you every day. And my prayer is that we would become so healed and delivered ourselves but that we would become ambassadors of belonging to the world around us. That we would be ones who minister belonging to people. That we would minister to people and help them understand, listen, it, you don't have to get it all together for God to love you. So many people live with this deep grief that God could never really accept them because they're fill in the blank. And that's not the truth of the gospel. Yes, God doesn't leave us in our mess. Thank God. He transforms us, but He transforms us. We don't transform ourselves. He transforms us through His love and His kindness and His mercy and His goodness. That's His job. I can't transform myself. It's the Holy Spirit who does that. I want to pray for us this morning couple things I want to do. I want to invite our our prayer ministry team to join me up here. I want to to pray for us and we're going to to, um, just have a moment to respond and and worship. I want to make prayer available for anybody who wants prayer this morning. Would you stand with me actually? You've been sitting for a minute. you just to begin to focus on the Lord right now. Maybe close your eyes. Just turn your attention towards heaven. I want you to think about these three these three things I talked about. The first one is casting out the lie. God, would you show us right now if there's a lie of rejection that has had too much airtime in our soul. And if he begins to just show you whether it's rejection from others or it's rejection from God or it's rejection from his church or wherever that lie has manifested, I want you just to break agreements with it right now. You no longer get to define me. That is not true. I break my agreements with that lie. I I am loved. I am accepted. I break the lie that I am rejected by God or I'm not good enough by God or I have to be better for God for Him to love me. I break that lie. Anywhere where He highlights that just that lie out. God, I, I'm, this thing has been in my generation, my family line too long. I'm not passing it on to my kids. I'm not passing it on to the people I love. I break any association I have with this lie of rejection. That I have to perform for you or that I have to be different for people to love me. I break the lie. And then I want you to, I would encourage you to just begin to fill the house with truth. You do this out loud, but I, I want, if you want, but I want you to just begin to speak truth over yourself, church. We have to get good at learning to edify our own spirits. We can't be dependent on other people to build us up. I want you to speak truth over yourself. I am loved. I am accepted. I belong to God and his family. The blood of Jesus is enough. My sin doesn't define me. Jesus' blood defines me. God chose me. In all my weakness, in all my quirks, God chose me. He calls me his own. Just begin to fill your house with truth right now. that might look like 
man, you need to start writing some of these truths down on, on little post-it notes and putting them around your room. Maybe you need to make some true statements in your journal and you need to read them to yourself twice a day until this becomes alive in you. Fill the house with truth. And then lastly, I want you to, to take a moment and just search your soul and consider for a moment. God, am I, have I put up walls to keep people out because of my fear of rejection? Or because I have believed a lie that I don't belong, so I kind of just push people out before they can push me out. And if he shows you that, I want you just to confess it, and I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to help you to begin to, to identify to you who are safe people I can begin to let in my life. Who are people you're putting around me? God, help me to embrace community. Help me to embrace those that, that you have brought around me to run with in this season. We're going to go back into worship here for a moment. And I'm going to pray for us um, before we do. You know, I think to, to a degree, probably all of us definitely have dealt with the lie of rejection in our life. But if I've been talking today and you're like, man, this is hitting home for me. This is something God is, I know God is wanting to root out of my life. This has been a cycle. This has been something the enemy is coming hard for me in this area. And, um, we want to pray for you. I believe today that we're going to see deliverance from this thing, that, that this lie is going to be uprooted, uprooted out of us. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go into worship. But during worship, if you want, our team is ready. If you want somebody just to come and pray with you and agree with you for this thing to forever be done in your life, we want to pray over you this morning. Father, I pray for every person in this room. Jesus, I thank you that you love us, that you've chosen us. I thank you that your love towards me is not based off of my performance. God, I pray for us in this room that you would absolutely uproot the lie of rejection in our lives. We just declare, Father, we don't want to partner with that anymore. I pray that you would make us so free and so powerful, God, that we would be ambassadors of belonging everywhere we go. That we would minister belonging to people. That we would minister healing and acceptance and love to people. God, I pray that any remnants of fear, of rejection by you or by others would be rooted out of us, God. That we would be so confident in who we are in you. That we would be so confident in your love for us. That we would get freed up from the fear of man, God. That we would step in and do everything you called us to do. Because we would not, um, we wouldn't have the fear of being rejected. God, I pray for people in this room who have felt like the enemy has just been coming for them in this area time and time again. I pray, God, that you would once and for all, that you would heal and deliver and set free. And I just declare over you, this does not have to be the story of your life forever. You are not going to have to battle rejection forever. We declare that it ends, that it ends today. That God is writing a new story of redemption for your life. And just like the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah, found him in Tob, I just declare the Spirit of the Lord is going to find you in your Tob, wherever you are, and come on you, and, and overshadow you, and overpower you, and, and bring you, and pull you in to the fullness of your destiny to do what he's called you to do. I thank you, God, that you love to, cho to choose the things that the world has rejected. Holy Spirit we're going to go into worship if you, if you would like prayer our team is ready and then I'll close us in a little bit just respond to the Lord
from my mother's womb And from my mother's womb You have chosen me
that declaration. We have been liberated. We are the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. God, I pray that that truth would go so deep in our souls. I thank you, God, for the deliverance that's happening around this room. Freedom. And we just agree from this day forward to partner with the truth, no longer partnering with the lie. Father, I pray. I want to pray for us this morning, just as we close, to be carriers, freedom bringers of belonging. So if, you, if you're if you willing to, to receive that anointing, just open up your hands to the Lord. God, I pray for us in this room that we would be carriers of belonging to the world around us, that you would anoint these hands, our voice, our words, our lives to break and to crush the lies of rejection in our family and our friends and our co-workers. Lord, I pray that you would anoint us to break and crush the lies of rejection and to release belonging and hope and acceptance and love to everybody, everybody that we meet, God. I pray that you would anoint us to be carriers, ambassadors of belonging and family. In Jesus' name.